Hello class, we're going to go over chapters 8 and 9 in Larson Freeman. And so for each chapter, I'm going to start with a video. I'm not going to play it, but you can play it and pause the recording. And so when you do that, you can watch this video in action. If you have trouble playing the video, you can also go to presenter's notes. And in the presenter's notes, there is a link to the YouTube video. So let's start with chapter eight, total physical response. So total physical response, or in short, TPR, is a technique that's been used for decades. Um, and it's also not just used in the ESL context, it's used in a variety of contexts, especially in the elementary classroom. So TPR uses kinesthetic learning, which is like physical movement, to teach language and to teach instructional content in general. Moreover, TPR focuses first on students' listening abilities. So students are asked to listen for 10 to 20 hours before they're even um, supposed to speak or to write down the language or read the language. So once again, later speaking, reading, and writing are developed. And the theory about TPR is it comes from the way that um, infants and babies learn. So first babies learn through listening and then later they develop speaking abilities and then and often in the school setting they develop reading and writing abilities. Well the same concepts are used for TPR. They're just assuming that a student is starting off from square one and learning a language and the best way to do that is how they learned their first language which was first through listening. So for the language use and learning activities for total physical response, many um, the method first can be introduced in students' native language, but then after that, almost all of the communication from that point is in the target language. The teacher will give commands, especially in the beginning TPR lessons, the teacher will give commands and then students will observe them. Later, the students will then follow those commands, so they'll be physically moving along and many times saying the commands with the teacher after 10 to 20 hours. So commands are repeated several times in the same order, and this builds memorization and an understanding of what exactly is the meaning of each command. And then the teacher changes the order so that students can practice and the teacher can gauge if the student is really putting to memory the different uh, vocabulary. Later, after about 10 to 20 hours of instruction, the teacher begins to write down commands and the teacher could, act, when they're writing down the commands, they act them out. And then the students can see and associate the command in the written word to the physical movement, the physical action that they had already practiced themselves with TPR. So when the teacher writes it down and does the movement to indicate what they were referring to in the, the earlier listening activities, students write that down. Eventually, after about, once again, 10 to 20 hours, students began to develop their speaking abilities. And the way they do that is by issuing commands to other classmates. And so they kind of play the role of the teacher and that they're telling their, form, their fellow classmates to sit down, stand up, or what have you, you know, doing different commands that they've already practiced. Another um, part of the learning activity is that there's a rapid pace of learning and normally there's a, and that involves rapid movement of the body. And so the idea is that people can learn very quickly a second language 
if they're using movement. And so um, the rapid pace helps keep them on their toes, helps provide engagement, but also it, um, it allows students to quickly recall the target vocabulary. So for the learning goals of the total physical response method, first, uh, one of those goals is that comprehension, so understanding the meaning of what the speaker said or what even eventually and later more complicated um, text, reading the text, what the author says. So comprehension, understanding will be demonstrated by actions and movements and by the students actions and movements also initially students should use their right hemisphere of their brain which is the nonverbal hemisphere when they're learning their language and then later they use both spheres of the brain when they become more advanced another goal is that students will learn from both observing the teacher and performing the actions themselves Furthermore, an, another goal is that student, students should have fun and not feel stress. Stress inhibits language learning and it um, decreases student engagement and student retention of knowledge. And so the goal of TPR is to make it a fun, exciting, active experience for the students. Moreover, um, the other goal is that students quickly will feel success from the get-go. And so basically the teacher does not move on in the command activity unless all students are mastering it and they're feeling successful. So they can recall it and they're performing the right action to the command. The idea is that when students feel initial success, they'll feel more engaged and they'll also have that increased confidence, which will support their further learning. Their mind will be open to more difficult concepts because they know they can be successful. So for the role of the teacher, the teacher is the instructional leader, especially in the beginning. The teacher demonstrates the new vocabulary, the new sentence structure, and even demonstrates the movements that students are supposed that go along with each of those uh, pieces of new vocabulary and those new examples of sentence structure. In the beginning, the teacher is the one who's speaking primarily, and students will respond non-verbally. So after this teacher demonstrates the movement that goes along with each vocabulary term or each sentence structure, for example, a command, students then will respond non-verbally by doing that command or doing that movement when the teacher says the appropriate movement verbally. In later lessons though, like we've talked about a little bit earlier, the students will be the, the leader or the speaker of the activity and, so, and many times the teachers will actually be the ones that respond so that students could actually give the teacher in an activity commands or requests, I guess is a better way to say that. And the teacher would could respond non-verbally by, by following those um, requests. And that gives the students an ability to practice with their speaking communication. The view of culture that's emphasized in total physical response is the everyday culture of the native speakers. So this is the, the culture that um, people who are native speakers use in their daily lives. And this is how they communicate at the store, with their neighbors, um, in social settings. That's the kind of culture that it's emphasized. It's not emphasizing a high culture or like an intellectual culture that can only be found in difficult and prestigious literature. It's more of the everyday common language that people use in their daily interactions.
For the domains of language that are emphasized with the TPR method, first of all, oral language is emphasized more than written language. You can see that evidence in the fact that it begins primarily through students listening and then eventually speaking the commands. But once again, oral language is emphasized more than written language. Eventually, uh, students will copy down the commands and they will practice reading the commands, but initial, but primarily the main focus is that students are able to communicate orally. So they are able to listen and comprehend what the speaker is saying and then also reply or respond orally as well in speaking. Also, as you can see, vocabulary and grammar structures are emphasized because those are the activities that students are focusing on, especially vocabulary. Um, students are learning a wide variety of vocabulary and they're learning how to physically move along with the vocabulary to illustrate it. And then grammar structures such as commands or such as simple sentences are first taught and then more complex grammar structures are later taught to students using TPR who are more advanced. The way the teacher evaluates, let's move on to chapter nine, communicative language teaching, or another short abbreviation is CLT. Once again, you can see this video in your own time, just um, you can pause the recording or you can just later um, come back to this presentation, but I would first recommend watching the video. It's, it's very good. Um, and so, Let's talk about communicative language teaching. So communicative language teaching, the language that's used and the learning activities that characterize the communicative language teaching method or CLT method, is that the instruction is in the target language only. Students may need to use a little bit of their first native language to navigate in the beginning, but the instruction by the teacher and what students are expected to um, demonstrate after the first one or two lessons needs to be in the target language only. And the learning activities that are emphasized are small group conversation games. Those are regularly used and the idea behind that is that students will receive immediate feedback through their partner because basically if their partner understands what they say and the partner responds um, logically to what they've asked or what they've said prior, then that, that gives them positive feedback. Now, if the partner becomes confused or gets lost or doesn't respond correctly to what the person said, then then both people, both partners realize, hey, um, I need to rephrase my question, I need to rephrase my communication, or something has broken down in the communication process mm -hmm. that we have to troubleshoot. And then those partners work together to negotiate meaning, to, to figure out what each other is trying to say in their purposes. Moreover, another part of the learning activities is that students are regularly asked to give their opinions and this indicates this can help increase engagement because students are asked what they think, they're having more of a choice and that they get to ex exhibit their own beliefs. And so students giving opinions is, is a very important aspect. It's not just rote memorization like in some of the other strategies we've learned before the students are expected to elaborate and go beyond the the basic phrases that have already been memorized. Also, students are in interacting and using authentic materials. So authentic materials could be everyday items that native speakers would use. So it could be newspapers, it could be certain texts, it could be realia such as uh, physical objects. It could be signs, for example, just basically anything that someone, a native speaker would use day to day in their lives. That is used in the classroom for the CLT activities.
for for the language use and learning activities, students are asked to regularly collaborate and to work together as teams. And the idea is that not only does it build um, collaborative relationships, it builds a positive classroom environment that's supportive, but it also teaches students how to negotiate meaning. And this will happen in conversations all the time. One person will either not know or not understand the other person and they have to work together to communicate effectively. Another part of the activities that's very common is the idea of the information gap. So in, a, in an activity or a conversation where there's an inf information gap, that's where one of the people involved does not know the answer. So if you think about it, when many times when you're asking questions in day-to-day -day conversation, that involves an information gap. So like if I go up to someone and I say, what did you do today? There involves an information gap. I don't know exactly what they did today and I'm going to try to find out. So I have to pay close attention because I can't just expect to know what that person is going to say. So I have to quickly negotiate meaning through my listening. Moreover, the person who's responding can't just memorize a response, but they have to think reflectively of what they did and they have to voice in their own words what happened. Well, the same thing happens with, all, with almost all the activities of the CLT method. The learners, one of the learners will have an information gap. They won't know exactly what the other person is going to say. And so it'll be unpredictable, but it'll also be more engaging that way. So moving down a little bit. So once again, the communication practice will not be as tightly controlled. Students have a choice. And so not only will it be unpredictable, so that will increase engagement because the speaker and the listener will want to pay closer attention because they don't know what the other person is going to say, but also it will give both speakers more of a choice in the conversation. And so when they've done studies that show that when students have more choice, they're more engaged and they also retain the information more. Furthermore, once again, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but students get immediate feedback based on how their partner reacts or responds. So if the partner responds in the way the student kind of anticipated or predicted, then that's, then they see that their communication was relatively effective. Like if the partner, I guess a better way to say that is if the partner responds on topic and in a relevant way, then the speaker who posed the question or who initiated the communication will realize, oh, okay, my communication was effective. But if their partner is lost or confused, then they both have to figure out a way to, to negotiate meaning. They both have to figure out a way to um, understand where, what went wrong, what broke down in their conversation, how to fix it, and even use words or phrases that the other person feels more comfortable using, for example. For the types of activities that are often used with the CLT method, so we've talked about the use of authentic materials. Those are the references for, com for communication that we've talked about. Those are going to be regularly employed in um, CLT lessons. One example that Larson Freeman gave was in an adult classroom with that was an intermediate to advanced classroom. The students read a newspaper article and then they um, commented on what the author had said in the newspaper article. And so that's an example of an authentic material because native speakers read newspapers. Um, another type of authentic material that we didn't list here could maybe be things from the internet or things from chat, you know, like a chat room or from an email or a memo from work. Those are also authentic types of communication that students should be expected to be able to, to know how to do. Then another activity is the scrambled sentences. 
And so that would be when you have a text that's already been written by, that's already been, excuse me, read by students. And so students have read the text and they're pretty familiar. And then maybe the, the teacher cuts up some of the sentences and reorganizes it. And then students are expected to put them in order. And the idea behind this is to also teach students language cohesion. So for example, often authors start with transitions like first, second, what have you. And then later you'll have transitions like in conclusion or to sum up or as a result. And so students are learning how people organize and order their their conversation, but also how they organize and order their written communication. Language games are also an important activity because they allow students to have fun, which increases engagement like we've talked about, but it also allows students to practice skills such as the information gap. And so the language games will often in involve um, one student knowing more than the other or and you know having more given more information not necessarily knowing more like background knowledge but having more information in a game than the other like kind of like go fish like when someone says do you have these kinds of cards the other person says go fish or what you know so there's there's some kind of information gap well they would play similar games like that but with more speaking involved not just saying go fish like i don't have this card but Maybe so-and-so has it or something like that. Some more activities are the picture strip story. And this would be when one of the students has access to like a, a story that's written with pictures. And there's um, it's like set in a strip, like a comic strip. But only one strip is shown at a time. And then the student who has access to the whole strip has seen the story and knows what's going to happen. And then they only show one strip to the other students so that students have a chance to guess what will happen next in the story. And this way the students have choice. There's also that information gap because the students who are looking at the strip only and only have access to one part of the strip don't exactly know what's going to happen in the future. Also, it's a problem-solving task, so students have to work together and collaborate to find out what will be the story. The goal is that they can predict the story without seeing all the pictures. And then they can check their prediction at the end when they do see all the pictures, when they are revealed by the student who's in charge of the activity. Another activity is role play, and so this would be when students take particular roles and it would also teach how language differs in different social, between different social roles and in different contexts. So one activity that they used in the Larsa Freeman book was an activity where one person was the boss or the manager and the other person was the employee. And it was in the authentic situation of a job site. And so the idea was that when you're communicating with your manager, your supervisor, someone with maybe more professional authority, or also to older people like your parents or to um, senior citizens, you often use a different way of phrasing things. Like you, you don't just say, you're not as, I guess, sure or definite in your answers. You kind of pose it like it's your opinion. So if the boss says, um, you know, what did you think of our team's performance this sector, this, this period, then probably the employee will say, well, I think that, or I believe that, or overall so they're going to use kind of more cautious language they're not going to go straight into we did this exactly or this you know they're not going to be straight blunt about how things happen or same thing like if a boss is saying how do you think do you think my 
email was effective in helping people understand the the office's policies on phone calls. Then the employee is going to say, they're not going to directly say, I think it sucked or it's, um, you know, it didn't make any sense or it was a horrible, who thought of that or things like that. They would probably say, well, I think there were many positive aspects of it, but I think there might be some, still some um, confusion about this policy or the, um, I'm still slightly unclear about this concept. So there's different ways to phrase things. And so that especially differs on what role someone is playing in a conversation and their social roles. And then the context as well. So if, if you're with your friends, you could say like that movie was junk or whatever. But when you're talking to the director of that movie in a um, question and answer feedback at a conference or a lecture or something, you would probably say, well, I don't know if this movie was as good as your others that I've enjoyed. Or there were many aspects of this movie that I thought were on the right path toward what I was expecting to see. But there were some things that I was left slightly confused or slightly um, unsatisfied with. So you have to phrase things differently based on the conversation and the context. And role plays will allow students to practice that. Moreover, so let's go talk, talk about the learning goals of the CLT method. So one of the goals is that students will learn communicative competence in the target language. So they'll be able to recognize the situation and frame their language based on the situation, kind of like what we just talked about. And also they'll recognize to whom or in what way they should address certain groups of people or certain certain people with positions of power or positions of authority or age or prestige. Moreover, students will learn culturally appropriate ways to communicate and that kind of goes back into knowing your audience and knowing the situation. Furthermore, students will develop a knowledge of the linguistic forms and the meanings and the functions of language, how language can be used to give suggestions, how language can use can be used to make requests, how language can be used to state your opinion or to argue a point or to persuade other people. Furthermore, students learn how to work together with whoever they're communicating with to negotiate meaning. So to make sure that both sides in the conversation are participating and both sides are understanding exactly what are the intentions of the that the, the other person is is intending to transmit in the conversation. Some other learning goals are that students will learn particular language functions. So they'll learn things like how to make promises, how to give invitations, how to decline invitations, make friendly requests, communicate their opinion in a pleasant way. So these are all different functions of social language that we use daily and students are learning different ways to to make to use that language in those ways because one critique of some of the other methods based on the people who developed the CLT method was that the critique for the other methods involved how the other methods didn't really contextualize the conversation they didn't put students in a real world situation in learning how to communicate how they would be expected to communicate in the real world. And so they might know how to make some statements like I have blue shorts or I have brown hair or I don't like ice cream or something like that. But they weren't able to interact with their neighbors. They couldn't give an invitation like, oh, would you like to come for dinner tonight? Or um, no, thank you, I'm busy, um, but maybe another time. Or, or making friendly requests like to their neighbor, like, uh, could you please um, 
I guess, collect your dog. He's running around my lawn and scaring my cats or something like that. Um, or I, I want to tell my neighbors on Saturday night to not have wild parties at 4 o'clock in the morning where people are arguing out in the streets. And I would have to, you know, if I didn't know the different phrases of language, I, I might come across in a not very positive way because I've never met these neighbors, but I still need to make the friendly request that they be respectful to the neighborhood. I can't just rudely just yell at them or expect that the police will always handle it or something. Moreover, when you're in a conversation or when you're with friends or in the workforce, especially in the workplace, you want to communicate your opinion in a pleasant way to make it sound like you're not a know-it-all, that you don't think you're always right, and to allow possibility for errors because people make mistakes. So if you are always certain in your statements, then you're more likely to be wrong. But if you leave it open to, you know, I think that, or maybe this is happening, or, you know, if you use those kinds of terms, it's a little less um, definite in your response, and then you are less likely to be uh, criticized for being wrong. Moreover, um, another learning goal is to understand the speaker or the writer's intentions. So based on the language the speaker or the writer is using, the person who's receiving that message can understand what was their intention. So were they intending to upset the other speaker? Or were they intending to inform the other speaker? Or were they intending to request something of that other speaker? Or were they intending to persuade that speaker to think a certain way? So it's important to understand the speaker and writer's intentions because that's how someone becomes communicatively competent. So not only do they, not, do they know the language structures and they can write complete sentences and say complete sentences in a language, but they also can communicate effectively in a real-world situation. They're culturally competent. They're able to follow the culture of a society and um, communicate in a appropriate way culturally. So the role of the teacher in the CLT method is that teachers will develop situations that encourage communication and real world situations, authentic situations that we talked about before. And during the activity, the teacher will advise students and, if needed, provide assistance. But most of the time, the teacher is observing the student's performance and then maybe writing down on a notepad or something students' errors and later going back to help students redress those at a, at a later time. The teacher doesn't really want to interrupt the activities too much. They want to kind of sit back and observe students and give them the, the students the opportunity to communicate with each other. Sometimes, if needed, the teacher can participate in the activity as a co-communicator. If students are maybe unclear with the activity or they need a little bit more guidance, then many times the teacher can be part of that activity, that authentic activity in which they're in a real-world situation and maybe the teacher is playing a role in that situation. Like they're, they're the employee, they're the boss, they're the store person at the, the store clerk, or they're the police officer, or what have you. For the view of culture for the CLT method, it the CLT method views culture as the everyday lifestyle of native speakers. So what's most important is learning how people communicate every day. So really sophisticated, high culture that's in very complicated academic texts is probably not going to be the focus, especially not in the intermediate, the beginning and intermediate classes. Also, um, this is something interesting, but students are taught to also understand nonverbal behavior because that can kind of indicate meaning as well. They're, it's culturally important. 
So, for example, in the United States, sometimes people look at their watch, for example, and that's a nonverbal sign that they have to go or that um, they're getting kind of tired of the conversation or something else has come up. And so that's normally a sign that the conversation needs to end. Um, so if people like look at their watch or look at the clock or kind of look away, in the United States, we can kind of tell they're becoming less interested in continuing the conversation. But maybe in other societies, it might not be as where, you know, time is not as strictly enforced. Um, then maybe looking at your watch is just all could be a sign to show someone, hey, look, I got a new watch. Or it could mean like something else in a different culture. Or looking away might just be a sign of respect and not to be too, um, I guess, intimate with the person or invade their personal space. It's not showing a, a lack of interest in the conversation. It's just showing a desire to to be emotionally distant as out of respect. But so that's based on each culture. And so understanding the nonverbal communication techniques of a culture is also really important. So the domains of language that are emphasized in the CLT movement, or excuse me, the CLT method are, is communicative language, of course, that's the main focus. And then all four domains of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, are used regularly and from day one of the instruction. And the idea is that you can understand the views of a speaker because you're having a direct conversation with the speaker. And so you can understand their views through listening and through communicating verbally or speaking with that person. But at the same time, you can also be, you can also, excuse me, learn um, the views of the writer through considering the writing as a conversation between the writer and the reader or the author and the reader. And so many times students are also asked using the CLT method to look at text and to understand the purpose or the views of the author and what they're trying to convey to the reader. Once again, it emphasizes authentic language. We've talked about that a lot. So language in a real world context or situation. It also emphasizes the different functions of language. So, and the different forms of language too. So when you make a request, there's different ways you could ask that. And it's based on your position of authority or your relationship between the person you're communicating with. So when I'm talking with someone I don't know very well or someone who has maybe a higher position of authority than I do in a job context, I'd say, would you mind or could you please or may you please do this? But then if I'm talking to my friend, I would use the word just can, like, can you help me or um, could, maybe even could if I want to be a little bit more polite. But so it really depends on the function of the language and what context you're using language. Because language can be, can take many different forms, both formal and informal. So in terms of um, the teacher's response to errors, the teacher does not interrupt the activity or correct students right away. They wait to correct students after the activity is done. And we've kind of elaborated on that before.